you all for coming to the second annual Abolitionist Day. And before we get started, I'd like to recognize the mayor of Gettysburg, Ted Streeter, who has come to the Slavery. 
Today, we are honoring Southern abolitionists. As we recognize these bravest of the brave, other people across the country are holding ceremonies for the traitorous flag of the Confederacy. Instead of honoring a flag of a regime that sought to establish a country to continue the enslavement of its fellow Southerners, they should embrace their heritage of courageous abolitionism. Contrary to what so-called Southern heritage advocates will tell you, over 39% of the people of the South were against slavery. How can that be, you ask? Well, the slaves were against slavery, and there were 3.5 million of them out of a total population of 9 million in the Confederate States. And there were many whites against slavery, but you don't hear too much about them because they were either suppressed or run out of the South by the police state that dominated the region. Southern abolitionism is as Southern as collard greens and fried chicken. <laughs> Not only did we advocate for freedom before the war, but we fought for it during the war with 180,000 black men joining the Union Army, making it the largest slave army in world history. Now that is something every Southerner should be proud of. I was one of the loudest Southern voices against slavery before the slaveholders' rebellion. I was born on the eastern shore of Merlin in 1818 and was moved to Baltimore when I was 12. There, my owner's wife, Sophia, taught me my ABCs before her husband forbid her from teaching more, saying literacy would only encourage slaves to desire freedom. But that did not stop me from learning to read. I would pay little white boys to teach me from the meager tips I would receive for errands. I also devoured any scraps of newspapers or discarded books I could get my hands on. Knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. In my later years, I wrote an open letter to my former owner, condemning him for obstructing the education of his slaves. Your wickedness and cruelty and disrespect on your fellow creatures was greater than all the stripes you laid upon my back or theirs, I wrote. I tried twice to escape in the 1830s, but did not succeed. I finally succeeded in 1838 with the help of my future wife, Anna Murray, a free black in Baltimore. Dressed as a sailor with forged papers, I traveled by train and steamboat to New York City. A new world has opened upon me. If life is more than breath and the flow <laughs> of blood, I live more in one day than in a year of my slave life. It was a time of joyous excitement, which words cannot tamely describe. I then moved up to Massachusetts and became a licensed preacher in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. I then began my career as an abolitionist speaker, and that is when I met William Lloyd Garrison, the editor of the Liberator newspaper and head of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Garrison encouraged my speaking efforts and included me in the Society's 100 Convention Tour of 1843, where abolitionists spoke at meeting halls throughout the East and the Midwest. <clears throat> Pro-slavery thugs would attend some of these meetings, and on one occasion, I was chased down and beaten. A Quaker family came to my rescue, <clears throat> but my hand was broken, and it continued to plague me for the rest of my life. Then, in 1845, I wrote the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, which became an instant bestseller and was reprinted nine times with 11,000 copies sold in America. Editions were also translated in French and Dutch. I then went to Ireland and England from 1846 to 1848 to raise money for the anti-slavery cause. <laughs> My lectures were crowded to suffocation 
And I also found that in these countries, I was not treated as a colored, but as a man. While I was there, many supporters were concerned that if I returned to America, I could be legally kidnapped by my former owner. So they raised 150 pounds sterling to pay my owner for my liberty, something the Declaration of Independence said was an inalienable right. It was hard to leave England with so many supporters in the air of equality. But my wife was still in America, and I could not forsake four million brothers and sisters in bondage. I came back in 1848 and started the North Star newspaper in Rochester, New York. Its motto was, right is of no sex. Truth is of no color. God is the father of us all. And we are all brethren. I also took part in the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 the beginnings of the women's movement in America. During the slaveholder rebellion, I campaigned continuously to recruit blacks into the military, and I helped form the famous 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. Two of my sons were members, and a third was a recruiter. After the war, I, pu I pushed for black voting and held a variety of positions, including being the head of the embassy in the Dominican Republic, President of the Freedmen's Bank, and United States Marshal for the District of Columbia. Less than a month before I died in 1895, a young man asked me for advice. I told him, agitate, agitate, agitate. another Southern abolitionist who was known as the president of the Underground Railroad, Levi Coffin. Well, I am Levi Coffin, and I am a son of the South, and a leader in the Underground Railroad. <clears throat> I grew up a Quaker in Guilford County, North Carolina. It is a little known fact there was a large Quaker community in North and South Carolina, having come from Pennsylvania in the middle of the 1600s. In fact, at the height of our Quaker influence, a Quaker was appointed royal governor of the Carolinas in. 16 and 94. But starting in the late 1700s, as the scourge of slavery tightened its grip in the South, more and more Quakers moved to the Northwest Territory, where slavery was outlawed. I became an abolitionist at the tender age of seven years after seeing the horrors of slavery firsthand. I remember being with my father when we were, when we saw a group of slaves being marched along the road. And I went up to one of the men who was in shackles and asked, why is he in chains, unlike the others? He told me he had been sold away from his wife and children and his new master did not want him to escape to return to his family the thought arose in my young head that how terrible we would feel if father were taken away from us. On another occasion, a uh, time I was with my father at a local fishing hole, and a slave we knew approached us and asked if he might sell us some fish, as he had done before. Then out of the blue, a man came up with a burning stick and struck him on the head, cutting his skin to the skull and setting his hair on fire. Swearing at the injured man, at the injured slave, the man assaulting him said he would not permit such insolence. 
My father vigorously protested that attack as I ran away in tears. <clears throat> as I grew older, I tried as much as I could to help slaves in any way, to convince their owners to free them. I even helped establish a Sabbath school. My students hoped to learn the Bible so as to convince their masters to beat them less. But this soon came to an end when other slave owners convinced their fellows to prohibit their slaves from attending the school. Now, conditions got progressively worse for the slaves until a law was passed prohibiting slaves who had been set free by their masters from remaining in North Carolina. This is when I decided to leave and move to Newport, Indiana in 1826, along with my wife, Catherine. Once we got settled and started a dry goods store, we found we were on a main corridor of the Underground Railroad. So we offered our assistance to the poor souls that we encountered along their perilous journey. At first, other Quakers in our community were reluctant to help us, fearing the law. They also warned me about my activities, and I replied, well, I thought it was always safe to do right. The Bible, in bidding us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, said nothing about color. I think I should try to follow the teachings of that good book. Well, <clears throat> gradually my fellow Quakers did come around and started providing food and clothing to the escaped slaves. Catherine and I got to the point of helping as many as 100 refugees a month for a total of 3,000 during the 30 years that we were active. We didn't accomplish this goal without a fair amount of trickery and subterfuge. We made several modifications to our house to create hiding spaces for up to 14 people. And when slave catchers came to our door, we would demand warrants and proof of ownership before they could return with the proper papers. Their quarry had been spirited away. My wife, Catherine, started a sewing circle to make clothes for the runaways, and we often dressed them as butlers, <coughs> cooks, and other workers in uniform. The most frequent disguise for men and women was as a Quaker woman with a high collar, long sleeves, gloves, a veil, and a large, wide brim hat, kind of like this. Uh, that would completely hide the wearer's face if the head was tilted slightly downward. Now, my activities were not only opposed by slave owners and their cronies, but from leaders of my own faith who believed we should not break the law, but rather seek to change it. In 1843, I was expelled from the Quaker group to which we belonged, and I and other Quakers of a similar mind for our own group, the anti-slavery friends. Fortunately, we were reunited with the original group in 18 and 51. During the slaveholders' rebellion, I was an agent for the Western Freedmen's Aid Association, which offered help to the newly freed slaves. I went to England to raise funds in 1864, and I told an audience there that I predicted the war would end very soon, the cause of the demise of slavery. And why, I asked, because then there would be nothing left to fight about. On the passage of the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1870, giving black men the vote, there was a great celebration which I attended, and I was introduced as the president of the Underground Railroad, a title that had been given to me by slave hunters who could not capture their prey. Amid much applause, I told the group then that I wished to resign my office, and I did, and declared the operation of the Underground Railroad to be at an end. Thank you.
Now a few words about the current statues war. As you all know, statues of the traitorous leaders of the Confederacy started popping up <coughs> over 100 years ago. But the powers that be didn't get around to me until the 21st century. I now have statues in New York Central Park and my birthplace of Talbot County, Maryland, and in the National Statuary Hall Collection in Washington, D.C. And in a great honor to me, the Council of the District of Columbia in 2016 voted that if Washington ever becomes a state, Lord, help achieve that. It would be called Washington, D.C., with the D.C. standing for Douglas Commonwealth. Now, I would like to introduce the action hero of abolitionism, Cassius Marcellus Clay. Thank you very much, Mr. Douglas. And I agree with you that I hope that eventually we will see the demise of that uh, great violation of the principle of no taxation without representation in the District of Columbia. And I have a question for you all. Are you having a good time? Yeah. 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 Okay. And we have I think there are maybe a few people standing, but we got five chairs down here that people can come down and sit in. And I promise I won't call on you during my presentation. <laughs> I am Cassius Marcellus Clay known as the Lion of Whitehall, the name of my Kentucky estate. I was part of a powerful political family that included congressmen, governors, and senators. In fact, my cousin was Henry Clay, who was a powerful senator from Kentucky and three-time presidential, I have to say, unsuccessful presidential candidate for the United States. One of his famous quotes is, I'd rather be right than president, though I don't really think he meant that. <laughs> and he was also known as the Great Compromiser because he brokered deals which allowed the spread of slavery into territories to appease the South. Well, I was no compromiser. I was an ardent foe of the infernal hell that is slavery. I was converted to abolitionism in 1832 when I was a student at Yale University and I heard the great abolitionist speaker, William Lloyd Garrison. It was like water to a thirsty wayfarer. I found I was exceedingly, I found that I was like an apostle to spread the gospel of abolitionism. And I went back to Kentucky to drive home the gospel. But I found it exceedingly dangerous. And I found that I had to pack two guns and a bowie knife to protect myself. Then at one particular debate, a uh, assassin tried to shoot me and in fact wounded me in the chest. But despite that, I drew out my bowie knife tackled the assailant, cut out his eyes, and threw him over an embankment. That's why I'm the action hero. In 1845, I started a newspaper called The True American in Lexington, Kentucky. Within a month, I started getting death threats. So I tried to forestall them by putting in armored doors and installing two four-pound cannons. But that didn't deter a group of 60 men who stormed my offices and took away my printing equipment. But I didn't give up. I set up a printing operation in nearby uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and continued to live in Kentucky. At another time, while making a speech in 1849, I was attacked by six brothers who beat, stabbed, and tried to shoot me. But I fought them all off, killing one of them with my Bowie knife. <laughs> I tell you, that knife came in pretty handy. <laughs> I helped found the Republican Party in 
Kentucky, and for a brief time I was considered for Lincoln's running mate in 1860. When the war started, Washington was full, was left defenseless because troops were in other parts of the country. So I formed, I got 300 volunteers and formed what was called Clay's Battalion to protect the White House and the Naval Yard. Fortunately, that Confederate attack didn't happen. Then I was appointed to be ambassador to Russia during and after the Civil War. In that position, I brokered a secret deal with the Tsar that if England or France dared to come to the aid of the Confederacy, Russia would declare war against those countries. I also had a hand in the buying of Alaska. Despite this illustrious career, there are few if any statues in my honor. However, my home of Whitehall is maintained by the state of Kentucky as the Whitehall State Historical Shrine. Also, nine years after my death in 1903, a man by the name of Herman Clay named his son Cassius M. Clay in my honor. And he in turn named his son Cassius M. Clay Jr. He later changed his name and you know him as Muhammad Ali. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Cassius, for that incredible story. We need more statues of you around the country, and maybe some of that great abolitionist Thaddeus Stevens particularly in Gettysburg, where he lived for 26 years. Now I would like to say a few words about the slaveholders' rebellion. For four years, the war brought death and destruction never before seen in this great democracy. And for what? Can anybody be ignorant of that answer? We all know it was slavery. Less than half a million Southern slaveholders holding in bondage four million slaves found themselves outvoted at the ballot box, and they made mad resort to the sword. They undertook to accomplish by bullets what they failed to do by ballots. That But even as we mourn that terrible war, we can draw great satisfaction when we reflect on the vastness and grandeur of its mission. The world has not seen a nobler and grander war than that. The blow we struck is not merely to free a country or continent, but the whole world from slavery. For when slavery fell here, it fell everywhere. Thank you. We will now have a selection of music from the Civil War era by Deer's Home. Please enjoy the music and food at this time. 